Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series. My name is Suzanne Miller. I'm a principal researcher here at the SEI. I'm here today with my friend and colleague, as of the last six months or so, Justin Smith, who joins us from NASA. And he is one of our senior Agile Transformation researchers. So I want to welcome you, Justin. And I also want to say I'm thrilled to get a chance to talk about this topic. We've known you as a customer in the past and, and really have done some really fun work with you on this topic of how do we bring lean and agile concepts into independent verification and validation, which in for our audience that may not be familiar with the DOD, um, that is a very important process that is one of the steps towards making something deployable to our, um, our warfighters and other not just warfighters, but um, other settings. So uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Suze. And I, before we get into all of the goody stuff, um, we do like to ask people that are new to the podcast series, which you are, uh, tell us a little bit about how did you end up getting to the SEI? And I know you've only been here six months or so, but what's so far, what's the most fun thing about working at the SEI for you? Oh, well, this, getting to do this is really fun. <laughs> um, so uh, I was born and raised in West Virginia. Um, I went to West Virginia University and studied aerospace and mechanical engineering, and during that time, really fell in love with the idea of, of NASA. Mm -hmm. I did a couple internships with them, one more on the aero side and one more on the space side, and liked that a little more. Uh, so out of college, I went and worked for NASA in the space shuttle program doing crew training. Um, after the end of the shuttle program, I went and worked for uh, the Navy Yard for mm -hmm. NAVC, so more of a PMO type role. Mm -hmm. and. You know, became a federal servant then and just wasn't loving living in D.C. and kind of missed that NASA family and that culture. Uh, so crazy enough, I started looking for a job and found a job in West Virginia, my home state, yep. with NASA, uh, which I knew was there, but it was software. And I never, ever thought I would have an opportunity to work there. Um, so in Fairmont, West Virginia, is the uh, is NASA's Katherine Johnson Independent Verification and Validation Facility. I know this is a mouthful. That's why we just say IV and V. Yep. Every now and then you see hear somebody pronounce it NASA four and five because on the side of the building are the uh -huh. you know IV and V looks very similar to Roman numerals four and five. Um, but while I was there, I learned about the SCI. Came you know we became acquaintances for a few years there and. Uh, over the past few years, I took a, a real kind of career pivot at NASA and really got into leadership and development. I actually went and worked for NASA headquarters and helped them run a leadership development program. Mm -hmm. uh, really got into coaching uh, others across NASA, got my coaching certificate and that sort of thing. Just really fell in love with that sort of work and knew uh, that the SCI was doing that across DOD. And so, um, yeah, that's how I ended up here. I got really curious and saw there were some job openings last summer and started to inquire. And come January, here I was. Yes, and we're very excited. Yep, me too. So, what's, but, besides podcasts, what's the most fun thing? So, you know, we're going to talk about some of these agile principles. I think for me so far, it's been getting to apply some of those agile principles in areas you might not think they would be applied in, right? So non-software development mm -hmm. type roles, which is kind of what we did at, at NASA IVNV. Right. Um, and so that's been a lot of fun, right? Getting to meet some new customers, travel to some new places. It's just been eye-opening for me uh, seeing this side of DOD, which is really cool. Excellent. All right, so let's talk about what we're here to talk about, which is independent verification and validation. And that, in particular, we want to talk about it in terms of software. Um, so talk to me about how is traditional IV and V performed for software and how is it different? How do you have to think about it differently when you start to think about applying Agile and Lean concepts to it? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question and something that was very new to me, right? Not coming from a strong software background. When I, when I got to NAS IV and V, I had a big learning curve to learn about that full cycle, full life mm -hmm. cycle IV and V, right? That was very new to me. Um, you know, in college, they taught us about how to design projects and you start early. And I saw some of that at the Navy Yard, but then when I got on the IV and V side, it was a whole different like feeling and experience um, because you know that partnership begins very early, right? Or very early on in those design documents, 
we would start reviewing things and providing that independent set of eyes to see how things were going and report back to the customer, right. uh, report back to our bosses, the Office of Safety and Mission Assurance at NASA. And, you know, that would continually build, right? So, you know, you're doing early life cycle design. And then once the developer starts producing things, you know, mapping all those requirements, we'll start checking those. They start writing code. We'll start looking at the code. So traditionally, that was done in a very waterfall manner. Right? I mean, NASA was, you know, they've, they were relatively new to agile projects, and that was a very new challenge for us. So in 2016, I think I have the dates right there, I, I started working on the Orion multipurpose crew vehicle, which, you know, just flew recently on its mm-hmm. test mission, uh, Artemis 1, yep. which was really exciting to, to see that kind of come to fruition. I had a lot of pride there. Um, but when I started out there, and I came over to the team as the deputy project manager, there was a lot of just churn within the team and confusion because things were different from the previous mission, which was Exploration Flight Test 1 to Ar- Artemis 1, which mm-hmm. at the time it wasn't called that, but that's not important. And what I was quickly seeing, and everybody was kind of trying to bring up, is the developer switched methodologies. Right. So they moved to uh, a safe version mm-hmm. of agile development, and that was very different for, for us. And we didn't have a lot of experience at, that, at our program with that sort of thing. Our analysts, who were some of the more senior analysts, analysts in the program, really good at what they're doing, really passionate about this sort of thing, were just you know, kind of confused at times with what was going on there. Right. So this, this idea of a project being developed using an agile methodology and then us having to go do some of the methods that we've, you know, had spent 25 years crafting, right. it really wasn't syncing up. And so there were all kinds of challenges associated with that that we kind of unpacked over the next year. That's ultimately how I, you know, yep. came in contact with the SEI. So when we think about agile, we think about iterative Right. We're going to we're going to see the same thing again and again as we improve it and incremental. We're going to deliver incrementally. And from an IV and V viewpoint, that is really different because we're really trying to you're building up that evidence log. If you want to think about it to say, yes, it's safe to send this up up into the air and in this case, up into space in this case. And that incremental delivery piece is one of the things, at least in other IV and V places that I've I've, uh, come in contact with kind of drives IV and V people crazy because mm-hmm. it's like, well, wait a minute. You're telling me that you want me to tell you now if this is ready, but I haven't seen everything else. How do I know that you're not going to change something later? How do I know, you know, all, all those questions. So those were some of the things that I'm anticipating you had to deal with. Absolutely. And, and so what did you do? Yeah. So first, <laughs> first things first was we had to learn what agile was. Yeah. So a lot of the team didn't even know what it was. And so that's when we hired SEI to come in and teach, uh, I think it was Agile in government mm-hmm. at the time. Yep. Um, and so we had a couple instructors come in. Will was one of them, um, and uh, Will Hayes specifically. And we learned about Agile. And, you know, at this time, we kind of had this mindset around Agile of, like, this is bad, right? Because, again, from our perspective, we couldn't do the job the way we right. wanted to do it. And so we're like, Agile's bad. Like, this is a bad thing. And so we learned about Agile, we learned about SAFE and kind of what the developer was doing and quickly realized, like, man, it'd be nice to, to have a consultant from SEI help us out. So we reached out, Will Hayes made the connection, and, and we ultimately brought him on as a consultant that kind of helped us, help coach us through mm-hmm. kind of this transition. Um, and so, again, I was a huge skeptic. I, I, you know, Will and I have great laughs about this from time to time. Like, I was a very big skeptic around this idea that this was going to work and that we could somehow adapt our processes right. and methods to make this to make this you know work for us right to get to get to a place where we could say hey we feel confident in the you know adding some assurance for the software we feel confident that it's going to do what it's supposed right. to do not what it, not do what it's not supposed to do and if something goes wrong the software is going to you know react accordingly so um you know, from there, that whole process, you know, played out over the course of about six months. And through some of the coaching, we recognized that in this particular case, it made the most sense for us to apply some Agile and Lean principles the way we did business. So in other words, become Agile ourselves, which 
I remember when that first happened, I just think this is the dumbest idea ever. This is never going to work. I, I remember reviewing the slides that Will was had, was preparing to kind of help yeah. you th- get through that. And, and he's like, I don't know if these guys are going to buy it. I don't know if these guys are going to buy it. Nope. <laughs> so it was, yeah, it was a big, it was a big shift. Yeah, it was a huge shift. It was a huge shift. And, you know, but the, it, again, it was that, that we didn't know what else to do. Yeah. Right. So it was like, if you can't beat them, join them type of deal. Um, and, and so we decided to, to try to implement some of these principles and we tweaked some other, the other ways we would do work. And we kind of view those tweaks as core foundations to this agile IVMV approach. But, you know, reflecting on the whole experience, there were a couple of ways we could have attacked this problem. Um, this was just the one that seemed to work for us was to kind of become agile because we didn't have infinite resources, right? right. We couldn't embed ourselves with the developer uh, in this particular instance. And so um, we really tried to uh, attack it um, from a risk-based priority and agile helped us do that mm-hmm. in the end, right? In the end, you know, looking back on it now, I can't imagine doing it any other way. And I've done it with a couple other teams in NASA IVMV, um, different flavors, right? And I, I know, you know, my former colleagues right now are kind of attacking these challenges as more and more projects are taking on an agile, agile development style. So give me a couple of examples of things that, that somebody who's doing traditional IV and V would recognize as being, oh, that's different. What were some of the things that you do with agile V and V that, that, that those traditionalists are going to go, oh. Yeah. So you talked about kind of the, the, that life cycle, you know, that building of evidence, right? Yeah. So. Traditionally, and again, I wasn't around for a kind of a traditional view, um, but from what my, my great project lead kind of helped coach me through this was, and it makes sense, right? So from an independent verification and validation perspective, you would receive documents, you would do your thing, you run your methods, do your different approaches, and you would deliver a message. It's some sort of milestone review, right? So that would, you know, that could be months, six sure. months, maybe a year. So you had time. You really had some runway. Analysts could could go do their thing, you know, in isolation for weeks, months at a time, and they'd find some really good stuff, right? We'd find some, you know, issues over here, errors over there. We would communicate those back to the developer along the way. Kind of have a big, you know, data dump at the end of, hey, here's everything we found. Um, so that that changed, obviously, right? So when this new, you know, when we're getting in there and the developers not really operating to that cadence. And we started seeing releases come out at different times. And, you know, there's huge gaps in requirements that are missing. And you go back and you say, hey, well, this requirement's missing. Like, we know that's not going to happen for two more releases. Like, yeah. So it was just that huge gap of uh, disconnect that right. we had um, from that jump, that shift from waterfall to safe that really threw us off our rocker. And there was that frustration that was building because folks couldn't they, they couldn't do what they thought they needed to do because again when they did their job right to the best of their ability and then the developers like yeah that's not right right we weren't involved in PI planning like we didn't understand what they were going to do when at that time program right? increment so, planning yeah program yeah sorry about that program increment planning we just we didn't really understand what they were going to be doing when yeah. because we didn't understand agile that right. well. Right. So it's part of the learning. So that was that was a big, you know, kind of one of the first red flags for us was when we started to try to do what we would normally do to, to meet their schedule cadence, things were missing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so the way I talk about it to people is you're moving from a nothing is done until everything is done. And that's the assumption of a VNV guy is when you give it to me, everything is done. And now I can look at the complete picture and look back and find the gaps and everything. And now we move to Agile. And we say, well, let's get this increment done and this increment done and this increment done. And there are going to be gaps that allow for learning, right? That's what we're trying to do yep. is increase the learning pace and be able to make changes that are necessary to get a better product. Yep. But what that means for an IV&V guy is he's got to shift his focus from here's the whole big picture to, all right, what is it about this small piece that is relevant for me to give a message about and... Just let it go, Louie. Let it go in terms of the requirements that are not there yet, right? Yep. And that, I, I, I mean, that's what I see as being like the biggest mental shift is from large batch to small batch. Yeah. You, you did some things. I've seen some presentations that you've given, and you did some things to help people with that by using that risk-based approach. And why don't you talk just for a minute about some of the things like the heat maps and things that you did to help the, 
the IV and V people understand you are making progress, even though you can't see everything at once. Yeah. Yeah. So as part of that implementation of those Agile and Lean principles and us becoming Agile ourselves was to try to break our work down, right? So as opposed to taking these big views to try to break them down. And so logically for us, we ultimately looked at the capabilities, Mm -hmm. which was very different. Right. It was a theory that Ivy and V had been playing around with for a little while. And I think we were one of the first teams to really make it successful because it made a lot of sense from an agile perspective. Right. Because if you started to look at the software and capability chunks, it was much smaller. Mm-hmm. Right. As opposed to like all of the you know guidance, navigation, control right. software. You just look at a piece. And so that was a huge step as the, at the same time trying to bring in that risk prioritization. Right. To understand that, okay, if you look at all these capabilities, in this case for Orion, there's a lot of them out there, right? And we only have so many people and so much money that we get every year to do this job. And so we had to make some decisions. Right. So we had to kind of evaluate those risks associated with those various capabilities. And so you, you mentioned a heat map. And so one of the, the things we came up with, which, again, I'll talk about this perhaps with you know, kind of one of the big takeaways uh, key concepts, if you will, were retrospectives for us. And Mm -hmm. that's where all of our innovations came from. And one of those such innovations was this heat map. How do we visually see how we're making progress? How do we visually see, you know, the the fact that we, you know, this risk or this capability was super high risk, but we did some analysis throughout these various releases and that risk slowly comes down, right? Because again, we'll revisit capabilities multiple times, multiple times if we have to, to drive that risk down. And so I actually just saw, um, just probably within a, the last month, I saw the Orion Artemis 1 heat map. And it was awesome. It was like almost all green. So it was so cool Yay. to see what had happened over a five-year yeah, you know, band yeah. of, of that group of individuals that have mostly remained intact, you know, whittling down risk over mm-hmm. time, right, to, to help add that assurance and provide confidence back to the developer, the program, and ultimately safety and mission assurance that, hey, we think this, this software is going to work. Yep. We think these capabilities are going to do exactly what they're supposed to do to make this a, su- a successful mission. I, I'm, I hope that, that the uh, VNV people in the audience are as excited as I am about, about what you've done because I know that that shift from IV and V in the large to IV and V in the small is big, but I, I guess the message that I take away is there's there are methods to deal with this, mm-hmm. and and you have to just start thinking. I mean, the big shift is think in small batches, and and I, and the approach that you guys took of what's the small batch for us, not just what's the small batch for the developer, but what's the small batch for us, I think is a key to actually making that work. Yep. Um, so this is something you know. Orion, very complex cyber physical system, um, highly regulated, uh, and DOD, we have the same kind of challenges. Um, and so when you think about what are the, what are the big things that if I'm a DOD IV and V person that I should be thinking about doing differently um, if I'm getting engaged with a program that is using agile methods? Yeah, so I think, you know, again, the way we did it, was one way. I think there's multiple ways to, to come at this challenge, right? So I think, first of all, is understanding the problem at hand or the challenges your team's facing. For us, that was working with the team, right? To understand from a leadership level all the way down to the analyst level what the challenges were. So I would start there, right? To understand truly where are people struggling? Where do they feel like they can't do their job, mm-hmm. right? And again, that will you know, start to build up some of that trust amongst the team and the psychological safety that ultimately, you know, an agile driven approach right. to, to anything has to have to survive. Um, so I would ultimately start there. The other thing that I think was really important for us in our case was kind of that partnership, right? Sometimes IV and V is very much viewed as an us versus them thing, sure. right? And it was, you know, early on, again, that trust, there was a lot of trust between the program yeah. You know, the Orion program office and us. There was trust between the Office of Safety and Mission Assurance and us, as well as the director at IV and V, you know, all the leadership chain down through. And and that's a big deal too. So I think that partnership and understanding and people understanding that, hey, you know, IV and V may or may not be a requirement for your program, right? For Orion, it was a requirement. Yeah. 
And I know, you know some of the DOD programs have that requirement. And so ultimately, there's some sort of partnership that can, can be agreed on without really impacting that independence. Yeah. Well, and, and one of the things that I'm, I've been known to say to people that are worried about that is independence does not mean isolation. Exactly. And, and so we know, and, and this has nothing to do with Agile. I mean, it's just we know there are ways yep. to be independent and still be collaborative. Yep. And good IV and V shops, that's their goal is to use the collaboration to help the their partner understand where the risks are so they can fix them before we actually have to go out in the field. Yep. I mean, that's the ultimate goal is exactly. to keep things from going out in the field that have defects and especially failure modes that are going to impact uh, the mission. So yeah. um, everyone's yeah. on the same team here. Exactly. Right? Exactly. We're all on the same team. We all but want the same success. But you have to build success. trust. Exactly. You got to build trust for that to work. Yep. And so that's, that, I think that's, yeah, I agree. That's, that's a key message. And that, and what I'll I'll see if you agree with this statement that, um, as you said, trust is a foundation in agile methodologies anyway. So it shouldn't be a surprise that we're trying to increase the trust between the IV and V and the agile developers so that we can get that fast feedback learning yeah. loop going. And IV and V, in my mind, can be a real addition to that learning loop because yeah. that fast feedback is coming from someone who does have an independent view. And I know as a developer, I've you know gotten my head buried in the sand a couple of times where I needed that independent view to be able to see the forest for the trees. Yep. And so getting that early and constantly, that's gotta be a blessing. Um, if you can if you can see it that way, right? Yeah. And that's so, you know, when you think about traditional IV and V and what we were trying to do, that shift was so different, right? Where we would deliver all those issues at a review or right. sometime that the program had established and we would kind of get up there and somebody would give this presentation of hundreds of issues we found. And that's great. So what? Right. What does that mean? Is that is that Are the software is good? Yeah. It, right. And, and, and how fast can we? I mean, the problem that I saw in traditional IV and V is you had all those issues coming up. And I could see the looks on the developers' faces going, man, if I'd have known that two months ago, I could have fixed that. You know, how come I have to wait until this big yeah. review to find these things out? Because now it's going to be a lot harder to go back and fix these things, the ones that really need to be fixed. Not everything has to be fixed, but the ones that really need to be fixed. And so, you know, moving to the agile approach where I get to hear about the issues really almost when they occur. I mean, that just accelerates learning yeah. like nothing else. And, and not like the other thing we saw in that same instance of the learning and getting it to them faster was the impact. Right, because yeah. coming at it from this capability perspective, our analysts developed such a strong system understanding, right? I mean, we almost had a three month stand down for them to really learn about the system, write these capabilities out. And so many of them came and told me like that was one of the key contributors was just understanding at a right. much deeper level what the system was actually trying to do. And so we saw, you know, an overall decrease in the number of issues. Right, so number of issues were coming right. down, but the ones that we were submitting to them were impactful. Right, they were big ticket items that they could put in their backlog to decide, which is their prerogative. Right, yeah. when and where to fix right. those. Right. When and where, you know, maybe we can't address this for Artemis One, but this is a big deal. We can tackle this and put this on the backlog for Artemis Two. So, and that and again, the timing thing was huge too because we moved from this months out of cycle phase because they were doing releases and we were always behind to bring it down to weeks. Yeah. Right. Where we could sync up with them biweekly cadence. You know, we would work with different teams on the, the government program side and they could get them to the developer where they are most applicable. And then, you know, it was just, it seemed like a, just a much smoother fit right. once we got, once we got this up and running. And I know that we're going to be doing a blog post on this topic. So those of you that are looking for more details, we'll get we'll get some more details there, and you'll actually get to see a heat map, uh, you know, kind of example in that. So um, I, I I don't want to build up too much, but we are we this is an area that within our group within the Agile Transformation Team, we're taking this on as as one of the areas that we really can have an impact, especially in the DoD, is to help these organizations that are doing IV and V apply Agile techniques to themselves and apply those techniques to the Agile developments that they're part of. And, and we're, I mean, having you here with this experience is amazing for that. But I want to finish, finish our conversation today by talking about uh, transitioning these. So you've had this great experience. You're, you know, 
one guy and one program that's had this great experience in this transformation. How do people that want to have that experience, what would you suggest they do to approach Agile iv and for their systems? And, and which we don't have many SEI resources yet in this area, but what can they look forward to in terms of SEI resources in the future? Yeah, well, um, the one thing that comes to my mind is mindset, right? I mean, it's all about the mindset that you take on as a leader, as a team. Um, we've already, tr- you know, we've already touched on trust and yeah. that psychological safety. That would have never been possible without that existing at Ivy and V. I mean, right. I had a, an amazing office lead, Wes Diedrich, who's now the program director. You know, he gave us a lot of freedom to go try some very risky things. And I say us, my project lead, John Bradbury, was crucial. He had decades of experience in IV and V. And some of those conversations that we would have about this mindset shift, right, and the, the different approaches that we were going to have to coach the team through were just, they were just crazy at the time. And, you know, it was just that constant working through that, talking through that, strategizing, right? And so I think, you know, if, if folks are trying to attack this problem, right, it starts at the top, right? It starts at the top to kind of strategize, understand, to build that trust, to understand the challenges, the requirements, right? Mm-hmm. What do you actually have to do? Right. What, what has to be done, right? We, we knew what we had to do from, for the most part, right? And we found things along the way. But it serves as some sort of starting guideline. But, yeah, I think that those would be, like, the key founding principles for me is for that that mindset shift to start to happen. It's mm-hmm. got to start at the top to build that trust within the team because ultimately those are the people that are going to be out there doing this analysis, right? How, whatever approach you decide to take to sync up with an Agile developed, you know, an Agile developer, which could look very different than what sure. we did, right? You know, we really wanted to try to do the integration route, but we just couldn't make it happen financially. Um, but, yeah, I think there's there's various ways. Um, you know, I, I still – I mentioned retrospectives a little bit ago. You know, so I would say think about some of the Agile ceremonies, mm-hmm. right, different things. You know, daily stand-up started working for us. I mentioned a, a little bit ago about, you know, where our analysts would be working in isolation. We brought them together, right? There was a lot of – Cross collaboration. What are you seeing over here? What are you seeing over there? Because they were sharing; these capabilities were overlapping, right? Right. right? And so there's some overlap there, and they could work together as teams, right? We actually had scrum teams, yeah, uh, that would tackle these. I mean, we and we played around with different things. Ultimately, we you know uh, we tried scrum for a little while, but Kanban made a lot of sense mm-hmm. to us with our backlog, yeah. Right. So again, you know, thinking about that, it's like you think about that scope, your requirements, what you actually have to do. Think about how to visualize that, right? So it's another Agile principle I think they could take a look at are backlogs. Yeah. You know, coming up with backlogs and and getting that work what you want to do down. Again, then you can build a heat map out of it if sure. you wanted to. And prioritize uh, and it. And prioritize it, yep. right? And yep. that, it's it's just kind of, um, you know, baby steps. I think that was the biggest lesson I learned when, when Will was helping us out was just take those first steps, yep. right? And is that Agile mindset, right? part of that is that continual learning, the growth. And like I mentioned, we we achieved so much in our retrospectives. They weren't like a traditional retrospective. Um, we had the classic, you know, what went well, what didn't go, what we would do, right. do, differently, do differently. But we would spend a couple days after that building on those topics, right? All of our innovations came gotcha. from those retrospectives. What can we do about that? Exactly. Yeah. What can we actually do about it? And we took that time. We were gathered as a team of about 30 people at the time and made that actionable. Yeah. Right, and we I, we saw some really cool stuff, and I I think people had a lot of fun doing it, um, and that's that's one of the things I'm most proud of, of that of that experience of that transition with that team was how much fun people seem to be mm-hmm. having, which is awesome. Yep, it always is. Yep. So you're here now. Agile IV and V is not your only thing that you have to do with us. What's next for you? And think about sort of what do you want to come back in six months or a year and talk to us about sort of what are you thinking about? Well, I'd love to talk more about this. Like what, what are we going to learn over this next six months to a year, right? Um, with engaging a different customers in this area, what's that going to look like? Um, are there different techniques we can try? I mentioned mindset. Mm-hmm. That's something I'm really passionate about is that agile mindset and, and applying that to non-development projects, right? How can you use agile concepts in other areas of mm-hmm. DOD, program offices, things of that nature. So 
that's something that I'm really excited about and I hope to talk about in the future. Um, but yeah, this is it's a great platform to, to share stories and, and share experiences like this. Excellent. I will look forward to those conversations. Um, I do want to thank you for talking with us today, and we will include uh, links in the transcript to resources that we've talked about, and a few we haven't, because I know you have some things out there that we'll make sure people know about. Um, and as a reminder to our audience, you can get this podcast just about anywhere. You can get it on Sound Stitcher. Oops, SoundCloud, Stitcher, separate things. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and my favorite, the SEI YouTube channel. So we hope that you will uh, watch it and that you will give us a thumbs up if you think it's a good thing. Um, and Justin, I look forward to you being with us again to talk about more exciting things in our Agile transformation. Thank you so much, Suze. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. This episode is available where you download podcasts, including SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. It is also available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts and the SEI's YouTube channel. This copyrighted work is made available through the Software Engineering Institute, a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. For more information about the SEI and this work, please visit www.sei.cmu.edu. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you.